Fugue is normally taught as an extension of counterpoint. This is reasonable, but often it doesn't go beyond that to the real combination of contrapuntal study, which should be fugue as a form of musical composition. Bach is, of course, the composer who comes to mind when we speak of fugue, but Bach was a great composer not because he composed a lot of fugues, but because those fugues are so powerfully expressive. In some pedagogical traditions, there is a form known as the school fugue with many rigid rules. These can be useful when beginning to study fugue, but they have not much to do with real fugal composition. For example, in the school fugue, the modulations always follow the same set pattern. However, this is not the case in Bach's fugues. Each fugue by Bach follows its own individual path, determined by the progressions of the individual musical form, not by some abstract rule. In this lesson, I want to take one of Bach's simpler fugues, number 5 from the Waltenburg Clavier Book 1, looking at it not just according to the conventions of fugue, but also as a musical composition. The point to here is to see fugue as composition, not just as an academic exercise. This D major fugue is fairly straightforward. It's in four voices and based on the following subject, which contains two motives, here labeled A and B. There's a counter subject as well. Here it is in its first appearance. Note that here the counter subject is based on motive B from the subject. In a school fugue, this would be considered a weakness. Why does it work here? For Bach, as a friendly serious composer, the form has to come out of the musical idea. If we think of fugue as composition, we expect it to develop the musical ideas in a way that shows them off most effectively. Since the subject here is exceptionally active, beginning with that 32nd note figure, a more complex kind of subject would be a distraction, making the texture too dense and less energetic. The exposition presents the subject four times, in the tonic, the dominant, the tonic, and then the dominant again. There's a little episode within the apposition in measure 3. This episode introduces two new motives which I've labeled C and D. Again, unlike the school fugue, these motives are often present, but not in the systematic way a counter subject normally is. They're mainly useful here for keeping the rhythm in the rest of the fugue more flowing instead of a bumpy alternation between the quick 32nd notes and the slower dotted note rhythm. The word fugue comes from the Latin fuga, which means flight. A fugue is a contrapuntal form where the imitation creates a rich conversation between the various parts. They can be seen as running after each other. Once the exposition is finished, in measure 6, there's a little sequential episode based on motive A. Since a fugal exposition is constructed around a textural progression, in this case from one to four voices, this bar provides a moment of relief since it is only three voices and none of them in the bass clef. When the next entry arrives in measure 7, it's in the lowest register heard so far. Register contrasts like this are very useful in fugue 
especially since fecal textures are normally rather dense. This bass entry in the tonic is answered immediately by an entry in B minor in the top voice. This looks like it will be imitated in the bass in measure 9, but it proves to be only the head of the subject. On the second beat, Bach develops mode of D. This is then sequenced in measure 10. When the sequence reaches its third step down in G major and measure 11, the subject is complete in the top voice. The use of mode of A in the bass on the first beat makes it sound like a stretto imitation, although the bass continues more freely. The effect is to create more rhythmic intensity. Bach is only paying attention to what's salient, not to academic rules. This is followed by two more entries in measure 12 and 13. Again, notice the stretto-like effect in measure 13. Then, in measure 14 and 15, there are entries in the tenor and the bass. This leads to a cadential progression in E minor in measure 16. Why? Well, up to this point, there's been more or less constant momentum. This lets the music breathe a little. In measure 17 to 19, there's a sequence resembling that which we heard in measure 9 and 11. In fact, it's an inversion of the former. But now the registral layout is reversed. Here, mode of A is on the top, in the answering part of the phrase, the mode of D is in the lower register. This is an important advantage of convertible counterpoint in general. The various inversions prevent familiar material, but the surface is new. Note also that the harmonic progression between measures is different here. The sequence finishes in measure 20 with an important increase in momentum. Mode of A is present on every beat here, leading to non-stop 30-second notes. Measure 21 again recalls the episode in measure 9, but it's not sequenced this time. Instead, it lands on a 5-4-2 chord at the start of the bar, where the 7th is in the bass, and it leads to two beats of 30-second notes, and then to a perfect cadence in D major, the home key. But this is not convincing enough to finish the whole fugue. A circle of fifths progression follows in the bass. G, C-sharp, F-sharp, B, E, A, and D. And this would be boring if the sequence were unvaried. In measure 24, the outer voices are in parallel tense from the second beat onward. This simplifies the fugal texture, and it's a common way to announce the end of a fugue. It creates strong momentum. Finally, in measure 25-26, only the dotted mode of B appears over a stepwise bass that goes all the way down to the low D, followed by a straightforward 1-6-4-5-1 cadence in quarter notes. Notice how this final cadential progression is stronger than the one in measure 23-4. Dominant tonic progressions are not all the same. There can be big differences depending on the rhythm and on what precedes them. For this last cadence, Bach builds up a lot of momentum, four beats of 30-second notes, in a very straightforward rising sequence. Then he simplifies the texture in the next bar, bringing it to a stop in measure 27. The build-up in measure 24 also leads to the main pitch climax, the high B, at the start of measure 25. We've heard that high B before, in measure 9, but not with this kind of a build-up. Remember, climax is not just a matter of one note, but how the composer leads into it. Overall, observe Bach's careful use of registral and rhythmic contrast to maintain interest over the whole piece, as well as his careful planning of its overall progression. Mode of A, which has the most momentum, is used to create extra energy in a very controlled way. In other words, Bach treats the fugue as a real musical composition and not just as an academic exercise. And, as in any good composition, the distinguishing features of the work come out of the character of the musical material.